This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. Aloha, and welcome to the monthly public presentation of the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii. It's good to see all of you here tonight. We're recording tonight's presentation for broadcast on the VSH TV series, Vegetarian, which appears on public access channels across the state, including on Oahu's Olelo Channel 55 on Wednesday mornings at 11 a.m. and on some Thursdays at 6 p.m. You can also view videos of this and many of our past presentations on our website, www.vsh.org, where you'll find many other resources, including our famous dining guide. It's now time for our special guest. We're delighted to welcome Dr. Melanie Joy. Dr. Melanie Joy is a Harvard-educated psychologist and professor of psychology and sociology at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Dr. Joy has written articles on psychology, animal protection, and social justice, as well as the award-winning Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows, an introduction to carnism. She has been featured on programs including the BBC, National Public Radio, PBS, ABC Australia, Good Morning Croatia, and the Austrian Der Standard. Dr. Joy has given her critically acclaimed carnism presentation across the United States as well as internationally. Dr. Joy is also the author of Strategic Action for Animals. Dr. Joy has been active in a number of social justice movements and she teaches courses which focus on systems of privilege and oppression, domestic violence, and psychological trauma. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Melanie Joy. We're okay. Yeah. All right. Well, aloha. This is my first time in Hawaii. Somebody asked me, I think it was you that said, does it look like, does, was it what you expected based on, you know, what you see in postcards? And I said, well, yes. And Hawaii, but Hawaii is a lot more, obviously, like most places, it's much more than just geography. So the beaches are beautiful, obviously, you know that, but I'm also deeply inspired to be experiencing a bit of the culture and to come out here and see so many people coming out on a Tuesday to engage in this incredibly important conversation. So that just, it really inspires me. So thank you for, for being out here, and I'm just delighted. I'd like you to try to think of one or more animals in your life who you have felt a connection to. So I'd like you to try to think of one or more animals in your life who you have felt a connection to. And as I was explaining, by connection I mean anything from identifying with an animal or animals to loving them. I simply mean caring about their well-being. So maybe it was the horse you took riding lessons on or the guinea pig in your school classroom. Maybe it was the dog you grew up with or a hurt bird you rescued. Or maybe it was a fish or a turtle. Now I want to take a poll. Raise your hand if you were able to think of at least one animal. Okay, two animals, at least two animals. All right, now raise your hand if you've ever felt cared about or loved by an animal. All right, that's a whole lot of love. And our experience tells us something important. We care about animals. We feel connected to them. I mean, we can see examples of this everywhere. We teach our children to be kind to animals, not to harm them. We make animals the heroes of our children's stories and the stars of their shows. When we're walking in the woods and we catch a glimpse of a deer through the trees, or when we see dolphins leaping out of the ocean, or when we notice a delicate butterfly resting on a flower, we often feel that sense of awe 
that makes us just stop and, and speak in hushed voices and watch with what some might even call reverence. When we hear of a mistreated or abused animal, we recognize the injustice and we feel outraged. When we're at the petting zoo and the piglet chooses our hand to eat out of, we feel special, right? We get excited. Can you relate to some of these feelings? I mean, I certainly can. So before we get started, I want to tell you a little bit about me and my story and how I came to be here today. If you haven't guessed, this is a picture of me and my dog Fritz a long time ago now. My mother tells me we adopted Fritz when he was about two months old and I was about two years old. So we were really both just babies when we met. Now, Fritz was my first dog, but he was also my first friend. We did everything together. We played together, we napped together, and we even threw up together once during a sickening summer road trip. And I'm not making that up. And Fritz was also my first heartbreak when he died at the age of 13 of liver cancer. And what I didn't realize back then was that Fritz, or more accurately, my connection with Fritz, would be the catalyst for my life's work. And that's what brings me here today. My life's work as a psychologist, professor, and author has centered around one key theme. It's a theme that is central to our freedom of choice and therefore to our personal empowerment and to social and ecological justice. And that theme is making the connection. I'm here to talk about our connection with other beings, with ourselves and with our core values and about the invisible belief system, the ism that disconnects us from these fundamental aspects of our lives. I'm here to talk about how this ism creates a gap in our consciousness when it comes to some of the most frequent and important choices we make, our food choices, and how this gap ultimately causes us to act against our own interests and the interests of others. So I'm here with a goal, which is simply to raise awareness of this invisible ism to promote personal empowerment and social and ecological justice. First, we'll discuss the problem of the gap. What exactly is this gap in our consciousness and how does it obstruct our freedom of choice? Next, we'll discuss the underpinnings of the gap. What causes and maintains this gap that guides our food choices and what are the consequences of our choices on ourselves and our world? And also, how does this gap reflect an ism that is in fact a social justice issue? And finally, because everybody likes the happy ending, including myself, we will talk about the solution to the gap. How can we resolve this gap in our consciousness to make more empowered and just choices? And how can we work to transform this ism that's interconnected with so many of the other isms? All right, so let's get started. What is the gap? Now, to explain this concept, I want to do a brief exercise with you. I'd like you to imagine that you are the guest at a dinner party and your host is famous for her homemade pasta and meatballs. And she serves you a dish that looks like this. I'd like you to consider whether you would find this dish delicious or disgusting. I'm not gonna take a poll this time. Now, for those of you who would find it delicious, I'd like you to imagine that you find it so delicious that you ask your host for her recipe. And flattered, she replies, well, the secret is in the meat. You need to start out with three pounds of extra lean golden retriever. Now, I want to have a camera up here for when I do this part of the, the presentation. So now, take a moment to reflect on your thoughts and feelings. I mean, chances are what you thought of just moments ago as food, you now think of as a dead animal. What you just felt was delicious, you now feel is disgusting. Chances are your experience of the meat dramatically changed, even though nothing about the meat itself actually changed. So what is it then that changed? Well, what changed was simply your perception of the meat. Now, our perception is the lens that we look at the world through. And when it comes to eating animals, our perception is shaped largely, if not entirely, by our culture. In meat-eating cultures around the world, people tend to have a tiny handful of animals that they've learned to classify as edible. All the rest they classify as inedible and disgusting. 
to consume. So even though the type of species consumed changes from culture to culture, members of all cultures tend to find their own choices to be rational and the choices of other cultures to be irrational and disgusting and often even offensive. So what's striking is not the presence of disgust. Disgust is the norm, it's the rule rather than the exception. What's striking is the absence of disgust. Why are we not disgusted by the, you know, eight, nine, maybe ten, if you're an adventurous eater, species we've been taught to think of as edible? And perhaps even more importantly, why don't we ever ask why? Have you ever wondered why you might eat chicken's wings, but not swan's wings? Leg of lamb, but not leg of kitten? They both come from baby animals. Have you ever wondered why you might eat beef stew, but not guinea pig stew? Clam chowder, but not lizard chowder? Hen's eggs, but not pigeon's eggs? Have you ever wondered why you might drink cow's milk, but not horse's milk? And have you ever wondered why you haven't wondered? When it comes to edible animals, there is a disconnect. There is a gap in our perceptual process, a gap in our consciousness. We don't make the conscious connection between the meat on our plate and the living being it once was. When I was growing up, I was the picky eater in my family. And in my house, we had a rule that no one could leave the table until their plate was clean. And so, not surprisingly, this often led to some late night standoffs between me and my mother. My mother would try not to let me out of her sight, and I would wait for just the right moment when she wasn't looking to slip my food to Fritz, my partner in crime who was stationed under the table. And if my mother happened to catch me, I would tell her I was just petting the dog. And she would believe me because there were plenty of times when I really was just petting the dog. And over the course of so many years and so many meals, I never thought about how strange it was that I could be petting my dog with one hand while I ate a pork chop with the other. A pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as intelligent, sensitive, and conscious as my dog. I never thought about the inconsistencies in my attitudes and behaviors toward these animals because, you know, to be honest, when I was eating the pork chop, I didn't actually think I was eating an animal. I had a gap in my consciousness. And so because this gap in our consciousness blocks our awareness of the reality of our meat, it also blocks our authentic thoughts and feelings about our meat. Remember when I told you you were eating a golden retriever? Chances are you couldn't help but think of the living animal and feel disgusted. And yet when you believed you were eating the flesh of a cow, chances are you had no thought of the living animal and you felt no disgust. And so when we're not aware of the reality of our meat or of our authentic thoughts and feelings about our meat, then we are also not aware that we have a choice, that we are making a choice every time we eat meat. And so this gap in our consciousness robs us of our ability to make our choices freely. Because without awareness, there is no free choice. For much of my life, I never questioned my choice to eat pigs and chickens and cows and fish because I never even thought I had a choice. No one had ever asked me if I wanted to eat animals, how I felt about eating animals, if I believed in eating animals. No one had ever encouraged me to reflect upon this daily practice that had such profound ethical impl implications and, and personal dimensions. Eating animals was just a given. It was just the way things are. But it's really striking, if you think about it, that our culture teaches us to spend more time thinking about what brand of shampoo to buy than about what species of animals we eat and why. When our food choices have such a significant impact on our bodies and our minds, and also on our world. 
And so now that we've talked a little bit about what this gap is, we can turn our attention to the next set of questions, which are, you know, where does it come from and what are its consequences? It was half a lifetime before I started asking these questions. It was 1989 and I had recently awoken to find myself hooked up to IV antibiotics at Beth Israel Hospital in Boston after having eaten what turned out to be my very last hamburger. According to my team of doctors, Beth Israel is a, a teaching hospital, so to my humiliation, I was assigned a cluster of young, good-looking interns who were fascinated by my intestinal activity, and I will say nothing else about it. And according to the Department of Public Health, which shut down the greasy spoon I had made the mistake of patronizing, I had eaten a burger that was contaminated with Campylobacter which is a foodborne bacteria sim similar to salmonella. Some of you are shaking your heads. Have you, has anyone here had this before? So just like imagine the worst gastrointestinal flu you've ever had times 10, at least that was my experience, that's what contracting Campylobacter felt like to me. So contracting Campylobacter was truly one of the worst experiences of my life. But it was also truly one of the best experiences of my life. It was a turning point for me. Before I got sick, I had been exposed to information on, you know, a handful of times to information on the horrors of animal agriculture. And, you know, but I, I, I knew also that, you know, like most people, eating animals or eating meat was antithetical to my personal values. And like most people, I, I cared about animals and I, I didn't want them to suffer especially when that suffering was so intensive and so completely unnecessary. After I got sick, I never wanted to eat another hamburger or, or any meat again. And so I didn't. And then something interesting happened to me. When I stopped eating animals, I made the connection. I had a shift of consciousness, uh, a paradigm shift. In other words, I didn't see different things. I saw the same things differently. Remember how different your meat looked to you when you thought it was a golden retriever? Well, that's how all meat suddenly looked to me. It's interesting how the gaps in our consciousness only become visible when they start to disappear. And as the gap in my consciousness closed, my mind opened. I wanted to learn the truth, the truth about animal agriculture. It was a truth that had been right in front of me. It had been all around me, but that I'd been unable or unwilling to see. And, and I wanted, I needed to understand how, when it came to eating animals, rational, caring people, just like myself, could just Stop thinking. So I spent about 20 years looking for answers, including about a decade of research that culminated in my doctoral dissertation on the psychology of eating meat. And what I found was to transform the way that I and, and others working in psychology and social justice thought about the issue of eating animals. So to share my findings with you, I want to start by doing another quick exercise. If vegetarian is the term we use to describe an individual who follows the teachings, the tenets of the belief system we call vegetarianism, and vegan is the term we use to describe a person who follows the tenets of the belief system we call veg veganism, what then do we call someone who is not a vegetarian or vegan? This is not rhetorical. I actually want you to answer. You can just shout it out. Carnist. Someone who has not read my book. Okay, good. I heard, I heard two of them, and there's a third one. Yeah, meat eater, right? So these are probably the most commonly used words. But let's just, let's talk about these terms for just a minute. An omnivore, by definition, is an animal, human or non-human, who can ingest both flesh and plant matter, right? 
And a carnivore is an animal who needs to ingest flesh in order to survive. So both omnivore and carnivore describe one's biological predisposition, not one's philosophical or ideological choice. And meat eater describes a behavior as though it's divorced from a belief system. And this is why we don't call vegans plant eaters, because we recognize that the behavior of eating plants reflects a deeper belief system or ideology. We tend to assume that it is only vegans and vegetarians who bring their beliefs to the dinner table. But most of us don't learn to eat pigs but not dogs, for example, because we don't have a belief system when it comes to eating animals. When eating animals is not a necessity for survival, which is the case in much of the world today, then it is a choice. And choices always stem from beliefs. So what I found is that there is an invisible belief system that conditions us to eat certain animals. And this is the belief system that I came to call carnism. Now, carnism is a special kind of belief system or ideology. It is a dominant ideology. That means it's invisible, it's entrenched. It shapes norms, laws, beliefs, behaviors, etc. And it is also a violent ideology. Meat cannot be procured without violence. And dairy and eggs cannot be procured without some harm to animals, and often a lot of harm to animals as well. And dominant violent ideologies, such as carnism, need to use a set of social and psychological defense mechanisms to enable humane people to participate in inhumane practices without fully realizing what they are doing. In other words, carnism teaches us how not to feel. Now, the primary defense of carnism is denial. If we deny there's a problem in the first place, then we don't have to do anything about it. Denial is expressed largely through invisibility. One way carnism remains invisible is by remaining unnamed. If we don't name it, we can't even think about it, so we can't question it, we can't challenge it. The invisibility of carnism as, as an ideology is why eating animals appears to be a given rather than a choice. Another way carnism remains invisible is by keeping its victims out of sight and therefore conveniently out of public consciousness. Now, carnism is an entire system of victimization. It victimizes all of us in different ways. But before we talk about the invisible victims of carnism, I want to do another quick exercise with you to give you a sense of the power and scope of invisibility. This one is a fill in the blank. So what do you think? 17,121 farmed animals are killed in the United States alone every what? And let me just actually make a quick point here. This number applies to land animals, okay? Only land animals. If we were to include, and it excludes rabbits for some reason, if we were to include fish and other aquatic life, that number could be quintupled. So, month. This is not the world, this is uh, just the US. Week, a few weeks, day, hour, okay, a few hours, diversity is good. Minute, there's, the, there's no room for, for a second, the source is going there. If you guessed minute, you guessed correctly. That adds up to approximately 9 billion land animals per year. So in the time it took us to do this exercise, nearly 20,000 animals were slaughtered in our own backyards. But think about it. How many of these farmed animals have you seen? Really take a minute to think about this. How many have you seen just this week or this month? How many have you seen this year, or even in your lifetime? I mean, just to put this number into perspective, think about how many people you see on any given day. And the US population of farmed animals is 32 times the human population. So that's a whole lot of animals. Where are they? 
I mean, given that these animals' body parts are literally everywhere we turn, why don't we ever see them alive? We don't see the animals whose bodies become our food because we're not supposed to. I mean, they are not, as carnistic industry would have us believe, living on happy mom and pop farms. I know, I have to use my disclaimer when I show this slide. It said on the caption read, happy cow. And as I've been using it to show to audiences all around the world, I've discovered that it's not really a happy cow. It's more like a creepy cow. It's like the clown effect, right? It's supposed to make you smile and it scares you a little bit. In the United States, approximately 99% of the meat, eggs, and dairy that make it to our plates comes from animals who were raised in factory farms, CAFOs. They're windowless sheds in remote locations that are virtually impossible for anyone outside of industry officials to obtain access to. And if you did try to obtain access to one of these compounds, you could find yourself in prison thanks to a number of so-called ag-gag laws. This is new bills, new pieces of legislation that are popping up as consumers and citizens become increasingly aware of and concerned with the issue of animal agriculture. According to Dara Lovitz, who's an attor attorney and author of the book Muzzling a, Mo a Movement, the AETA, that's the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act that we have in the United States, that states that one has committed the federal crime of terrorism if they engage in any activity that may reduce the profits of an animal enterprise. And these are, these are bills that are popping up in countries around the world. It's very interesting and quite telling. Well, I'm actually going to show you a very short video clip, which is non, um, narrated by Dr. Jonathan Balcom, who spoke here, was it last year that he spoke here, just last year or two years ago? He's uh, an animal behaviorist and author of over 40 scientific papers and four books on animal cognition. And this gives us a rare glimpse into the inner lives of farmed animals. Pigs are intelligent, playful, and curious. Like us, they are also natural pleasure seekers. I often kneel down next to one of the adult pigs, maybe Fern or Rosie, lazing in the thick hay of their barn at Poplar Spring Animal Sanctuary. I scratch their heads and stroke their ears to let them know I'm a nice guy. Then I start to rub their belly. More often than not, the pig will make an effort to reposition him or herself, shifting several hundred pounds of weight to expose more of the belly for scratching and rubbing. This simple act says, that feels good. Sometimes they grunt in satisfaction. Their bellies are warm and very soft, and it's almost as much fun to administer the belly rub as it is to receive it. Almost. <laughs> Cows form a strong emotional bond with their calves. For example, shortly after graduating from Cornell University Veterinary School, Dr. Holly Cheever was called out to a busy dairy when a cow mysteriously stopped producing milk. The cow had recently delivered her fifth baby out in the pasture. As was usual dairy farm practice, her calf was taken away as soon as she returned to the milking barn. Normally a milked cow will produce over 12 gallons per day, but this cow always returned for the evening milking with an empty udder. Dr. Cheever couldn't figure out what was going on, but on the 11th day, the farmer called to say he had followed the cow out into the fields where he discovered she had produced twins. Having lost four previous babies, the mother cow had made a Sophie's choice, returning one of her precious children and keeping the other in the woods at the pasture's edge. Cheever pleaded with the farmer to let the cow keep her twin calf, but he was sent off to a veal crate. This incident invokes a cow's painful memory of earlier loss and a level of complex reasoning few would attribute to a cow. Chickens and turkeys are social species with well-developed vocabularies of calls. Each bird recognizes all the other individuals in a flock by their appearance and by their voice. I remember watching a mixed flock of roosters who had recently been rescued from the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. They were happily foraging in the grass when suddenly they all made a dash to a nearby shed. Only as they reached cover did I notice a hawk flying overhead. Chickens and turkeys have specific calls for aerial predators, and one of them had sounded the alarm. This is considered virtuous behavior because the alarm caller runs the extra risk of drawing attention to him or herself. Fishes are as misunderstood as they are diverse. Careful scientific experiments show that they experience pain. They also have emotions, such as the fear of predators seen here. Fish can recognize other individuals, they have prodigious memories, and they have preferred shoal mates. Lobsters and crabs also show the experience of pain. Some crabs will refuse to accept food and eventually die after one of their claws is twisted off. 
Shrimp groom body parts that were pinched or shocked and stopped doing so after treatment with a painkiller. Though we're still unraveling the mysteries of animal minds, there is no doubt that animals think and feel and that they have rich emotional and social lives. Okay. I know some of those scenes were just lovely, weren't they? Most of these animals were residents of Farm Sanctuary, which is the nation's leading farmed animal protect protection organization, which also, unfortunately, is home to only a tiny minority of farmed animals. So in a moment, I'm actually going to show you another very short video clip that offers a rare glimpse into the lives of the 99%. But before I do, I want to give you a quick heads up, especially people with children. The film that I'm going to show is also quite short. It's undercover footage of animal factories and it can be distressing for some people to witness. So I want to remind you that my goal here today is not to distress you, it's to raise awareness. And to do that, I have got to make the invisible visible. So I, I spent a lot of time selecting material that I felt was sufficient to inform you without actually traumatizing you. And so I want to encourage you to push your comfort zone and witness this video because I do believe that the few moments of discomfort you feel will be well worth the empowerment that awareness ultimately brings. And this is feedback I've gotten from thousands of people around the world over the years. But I also want to encourage you to pay attention to yourself. And for some of you, it might be too much to see, so plug your ears, close your eyes. I'll keep the sound low enough so you can block it out if you need to. It's about four minutes long, okay? Mother sows are locked in narrow metal stalls barely larger than their own bodies. Soon after birth, piglets are castrated by workers who cut into their skin and rip out their testicles. Next, the workers chop off their tails. Both of these painful procedures are nearly always done without anesthesia. Others are killed by being slammed headfirst into the ground. Once pigs have reached market weight, they are sent to slaughter. At the slaughterhouse, pigs are knocked in the head with a steel rod, hung upside down, and have their throats slit. Proper stunning condemns many pigs to having their throats slit while they are fully conscious and suffering. Because male chicks don't lay eggs and do not grow quickly enough to be raised profitably for meat, they are killed within hours after hatching. Male chicks are typically thrown into giant grinding machines while still alive. This practice is deemed standard and acceptable by the egg industry. The females have it even worse, destined for a life of prolonged cruelty. To reduce pecking, induced by overcrowded living conditions, workers use a hot blade or laser to remove part of the chick's beaks. After debeaking, the birds are moved to cages where they will spend the rest of their lives. Nearly 95% of egg-laying hens spend their lives confined in tiny wire cages like this. Through genetic selection, chickens and turkeys raised for meat have been bred to grow so large so quickly that many suffer crippling leg disorders, chronic joint pain, and even fatal heart attacks. Those who live to reach market weight are thrown into transport crates and loaded onto trucks bound for slaughter plants. At the slaughter plant, the birds are dumped from their crates, then roughly snapped upside down into moving shackles by their fragile legs. They are then pulled across a blade which slices their throats, causing blood to pour from their necks. Calves on dairy farms are dragged away from their mothers and violently killed, all so that humans can have the milk instead. The majority of today's dairy cows are confined on factory farms. Workers subject young cows to painful mutilations and amputations. At a fraction of their natural lifespan, the so-called spent dairy cows are prodded onto transport trucks and shipped to slaughterhouses. Unreliable stunning practices at the slaughterhouse condemn many cattle to having their throats cut and their limbs hacked off while still alive and conscious. Undercover investigations at kosher slaughterhouses in the United States have documented the routine practice of cutting open the throats of fully aware and alert cattle.
massive trawling nets indiscriminately drag hundreds of tons of fish and other animals along the ocean floor. They are then tossed on board where the surviving fish either suffocate or are crushed to death. Others are still alive when they are hacked apart on these floating slaughterhouses. Like factory farmed animals on land, farm-raised fish are crowded by the tens of thousands in small, disease- and excrement-ridden areas for their entire lives. When fish reach market weight, they are loaded onto tanker trucks and shipped to slaughter, where common killing methods include slow suffocation. Good job. I know this is four minutes out of an hour long presentation and people always say it feels like it's the longest part of the whole presentation. So thank you for bearing witness. I know it's difficult. Before we move on, I want to just quickly point out that much of what you've seen here are in fact standard industry practices that apply to so-called free range and organic facilities as well. Whenever people witness the truth about animal agriculture, they always ask me, Melanie, how is this possible? How is this legal? And I reply that not only is it legal, there's an entire industrial complex built around this kind of violence and slaughter. Animal agribusiness in the United States alone is a $125 billion industry. And there are countless companies, just like this one, selling an emasculator, a castrator, as though it were a nail clipper. You could even buy a castrator if you wanted to on eBay, believe it or not. Which is where I bought mine. Before you make assumptions about what kind of woman I am, <laughs> that I have a castrator in my purse, let me explain. I'm on a, this is the third year of an international speaking tour where I give this presentation. I've wanted to bring something with me that's tangible to show people that's not just images on slides. And I spent several months looking for something. But because I'm on airplanes all the time, I can't bring anything too sharp. I can't bring anything too large. This is when the cameras all come out, I love it. So I actually, I wound up buying a castrator that looks like this. And it is for baby animals. It doesn't open that wide. It's called a crush castrator. It crushes the spermatic or the testicular cord. It's used on sheep and, and piglets. And I used to offer to pass this around, but I've discovered that, that people usually don't want to hold it and feel it and see it. But this is what it looks like. I have to tell you that getting through airport security has taken on a whole new dimension for me of humiliation. And I used to say, when I was single that I had this terrible fear of being on a date one day and forgetting that I had left my castrator in my purse and going for my wallet and I used to yeah it wasn't good for my love life but anyway you know what it looks like now it's absurd I mean this is crazy but it makes sense when you think about the industry itself and you know as I mentioned obviously the animals pay dearly for our carnism but animals are not the only invisible victims of the system Another group of invisible victims are the meat packers and slaughterhouse workers, many of whom are non-English speaking immigrants, documented and undocumented, who cannot advocate for their rights, who work in a highly dangerous, death-saturated environment, and not surprisingly have been found to have high rates of post-traumatic stress and addictions. I'm not going to spend too much time on this issue, but I want to just share with you three titles of OSHA accident reports to give you a sense of what these people have to contend with. Employee hospitalized for neck laceration from flying blade. Employee's eye injured when struck by hanging hook. Employee decapitated by chain of hide puller machine. In fact, in 2005, for the first time ever, Human Rights Watch issued a report criticizing a single US industry, the meat industry, for working conditions so appalling they violate basic human rights. And our environment is an invisible victim of carnism. According to the United Nations, animal agriculture is one of the most significant contributors to the most serious environmental problems facing the world today. And we are the invisible victims of carnism. We pay for our carnism with our health, as eating animal foods has been linked with the most common and serious diseases in the Western world. 
According to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, the nation's leading body of professional dietitians, vegan diets, pure vegetarian diets, are not only nutritionally adequate, but they can actually be beneficial in the treatment and prevention of disease. So when invisibility inevitably falters, we need to be able to justify eating animals. And the way we learn to justify eating animals is by learning to believe that the myths of meat, eggs, and dairy are the facts of meat, eggs, and dairy. Now, there's a vast mythology surrounding eating animals, but all of these myths fall under what I refer to as the three ends of justification. I'd like you to try to guess what they are. Eating meat, eggs, and dairy is fill in the blank. I love it. That's great. I love it. You got it. Normal, natural, and necessary. And a while back, I actually started timing groups, but they got it so fast, I didn't even get up to two seconds. It was like no fun. It's amazing to me that people know everywhere in the world I go, I do this exercise, and people always know. Why do we always know? So we've heard it all before. These same arguments have been used to justify violent practices throughout the course of human history. Can you see in the back? Slavery is normal, natural, and necessary. Male dominance is normal, natural, and necessary. Heterosexual supremacy is normal, natural, and necessary. Now let's just quickly look at each of these myths in turn. Eating animals is normal. Well, what we call normal is really just the beliefs and behaviors of the dominant culture. It is the carnistic norm. And carnism as a social norm is so entrenched that it is virtually impossible to see unless we step outside of the carnistic box. So to step outside the box, I want to do another quick exercise with you. I'd like you to imagine that you are back at that dinner party where your host has just told you that you're eating a golden retriever. But now imagine that you tell your host how you feel. And she replies by telling you not to worry, not to feel bad, because the dog had a good life. She was able to run and play, and she even formed friendships with other golden retrievers and some people before she was killed at six months old. Does she taste any better? Now, I had one woman at a talk a couple of years ago say, it's even worse now, her friends miss her. She had a life that she wanted to keep on living. Eating animals is natural. Well, what we call natural is really just the dominant culture's interpretation of history. It refers not to human history, but to carnistic history. It references not our fruit-eating ancestors, but rather their flesh-eating descendants. In other words, we only look as far back in history as we need to to justify current carnistic practices. To be fair, murder and rape are arguably as long-standing and therefore as natural as eating animals. And yet we don't invoke the longevity of these practices as a justification for them today. And finally, eating animals is necessary. Well, what we call necessary is simply what's necessary to maintain the dominant culture, to maintain the carnistic status quo. And here, I'm just going to let a picture speak for itself. For people in the back, this is the number of animals killed since opening this slide, and we are up to almost 25,000 marine animals, now it's 30. 17,000 chickens, now it's 20. 600, 700 pigs, you get where this is going. I'm not kidding. <laughs> but the myths of meat prevail, and they prevail despite overwhelming evidence to the contrary, and that's because the system is so entrenched. Now, when I look back on my own resistance to witnessing the truth about eating animals, I can see how these prevailing myths had a tremendous impact on me, as they do on all of us. I mean, I couldn't close that gap in my consciousness until I was ready to make the behavioral change that would inevitably follow. And I couldn't make that change until I felt safe enough to do so. I had a lot of fears and concerns. Would I get sick? 
Would I go broke buying expensive vegan foods? Would I have to subsist on a diet of tofu and cardboard? And what about my relationships? And my father was, he is today, a charter captain. He's a professional fisherman. My uncle has been an avid hunter his entire life. My Jewish stepmother made the best matzo ball soup this side of the equator. My Italian nana thrived on stuffing, overstuffing us, full of her lasagna marinara. And my half Lebanese mother served an Arabic lamb dish as the centerpiece for every special occasion. So, you know, what would happen if I rejected the traditions that bonded me to my family? And what I didn't realize back then was that although change is always somewhat scary and changing ingrained behaviors is always somewhat difficult, that this kind of change would also be tremendously empowering. And I didn't realize that, that many of my fears were unfounded, that I would be healthier today at, okay, in two weeks, but close enough, 47, than I was when I would half, was half my age. I can still say 46, but I'm closer to 47. And I didn't realize, thank you, and I didn't realize that I would be able to eat and cook even more abundantly. And I didn't realize that the deepest bonds with others are forged not through unquestioningly following the dictates of tradition, but by becoming the kind of person who practices authenticity and integrity, the cornerstones of meaningful relationships. John F. Ke Kennedy once said that belief in myths allows the comfort of opinion without the discomfort of thought. JFK did not underestimate the power of myths, and neither should we. Because as I said, the myths of meat prevail. They prevail largely because the system is institutionalized. It's embraced and maintained by all major social institutions, from the family to the state. It's become self-perpetuating. And when we're born into an entrenched system such as carnism, we inevitably absorb the system's logic as our own. In other words, we internalize carnism. We learn to look at the world through the lens of carnism. And carnism uses a set of defenses that distort our perceptions of meat, eggs, dairy, and the animals we eat so that we can feel comfortable enough to consume them. For instance, carnism teaches us to see animals as objects. So we learn to refer to this turkey as something rather than someone. Or we call this little baby an it, a thing, rather than he or she. Carnism teaches us to see animals as abstractions, as lacking in any individuality or any personality of their own, and instead simply as abstract members of a group. A pig is a pig, and all pigs are the same. And like other victims of violent ideologies, we give them numbers rather than names. An example of this defense is summed up nicely by a meat cutter I interviewed for my doctoral dissertation who said, I don't think of farmed animals as individuals. I wouldn't be able to do my job if I got that personal with them. When you say individuals, you mean as a unique person, as a unique thing, with its own name and its own characteristics, its own little games that it plays, yeah? Yeah, I'd really rather not know that. I'm sure it has it, but I'd rather not know it. And carnism teaches us to place animals in rigid categories in our minds so that we can harbor very different feelings and carry out very different practices toward different species. For instance, a meat eater I interviewed told me that she regularly consumes a variety of types of meat. And when I asked her then if she ate veal, she got very quiet and looked at me with this shocked expression on her face. And she said, well, let's just say I came to your house and you told me that I had just eaten veal. I'd probably vomit. Like, I have to get that out of my system. And when I asked her why, she said, because veal comes from a baby. I can't eat a baby. When we look at the world through the lens of carnism, we fail to see the absurdities of the system. So we see images like this or like this, someone mutilating their own body in order to be eaten. And we take no notice rather than take offense. We see images like this or this and we laugh rather than cry. 
Voltaire was right. If we believe absurdities, we shall commit atrocities. And carnism is but one of the many atrocities, one of the many violent ideologies that are an unfortunate part of the human legacy. And although the experience of each set of victims will always be somewhat unique, the ideologies themselves are structurally similar. The mentality that enables such violence is the same. It's the mentality of domination and subjugation, of privilege and oppression. It's the mentality that causes us to turn someone into something, to reduce a life to a unit of production, to erase someone's being. It is the might makes right mentality that makes us feel entitled to wield complete control over the lives and deaths of those with less power just because we can, and to feel justified in our actions because they're only savages, women, animals. It is the mentality of meat. And so if we fail to pick out the common threads that are woven through all violent ideologies, then we will be doomed to just recreate atrocities in new forms. This is why it is vital that we incorporate all oppressive systems into our analysis, into our awareness, including carnism. Eating animals is not simply a matter of personal ethics. It is the inevitable end result of a deeply entrenched oppressive ism. Eating animals is a social justice issue. Martin Luther King understood the ways in which oppressive systems reinforce one another. He wisely cautioned that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And the opposite is also true. Justice anywhere is a threat to injustice everywhere. And justice is not an abstract concept. Justice is a practice. It's a, a practice that can be carried out anywhere. On the streets of the nation's capital, in a courtroom, in a golf club ballroom. And we can also practice justice on our plates. So this brings us to the conclusion. Knowing what we know about the problem that is carnism, what do we do about it? What is the solution to the gap? Now I want to address this question with another question for you. What do you think is the reason that we use carnistic defenses in the first place? Does anyone want to guess? We don't use them. Well, a lot of people do use them, and many people in this room, I can assure you, probably do. Sometimes it's fear of change, change but what else? Why not just be straight about it? Exactly, because we care. You're absolutely right, we care. We care about animals, we care about justice, and we care about the truth. And carnism depends on our not caring, and the system is built on deception. I have been speaking about the issue of animal agriculture for about 20 years now, and I almost never encounter a person who doesn't cringe when faced with images of animals suffering. So the good news is that carnism is a house of cards. It's a vulnerable system that needs a strong fortress to protect itself from its very own proponents, us. I mean, why else would we need to go through all the psychological acrobatics if not because we care? And so our caring is both the problem and the solution. Our caring is what makes us want to turn away from the truth. But our caring is also what gives us the courage to face the truth, the courage to bear witness. Throughout the course of human history, virtually every atrocity was made possible because the populace turned away from a reality that they felt was too painful to face. And virtually every revolution, every social transformation was made possible because a group of people chose to bear witness and they demanded that others bear witness as well. So despite what mainstream carnistic culture would have us believe, there is reason to be very, very hopeful. The vegan movement, which is the counterpoint to carnism, is in fact thriving. For example, in 
Between 2008 and 2011, the U.S. population of vegans and vegetarians has actually doubled. And this is a trend that is happening in many places around the world. A recent Business Week article entitled The Rise of the Power Vegans states that a growing number of America's most powerful bosses have become vegan. More and more leaders and celebrities are saying no to carnism. Ellen even has her own website dedicated entirely to going vegan. I mean, it's amazing to see the explosion of the movement. Vegan cookbooks and innovative foods and restaurants are literally popping up everywhere. And this again is a trend I see happening in many places in the world. So to wrap up now, coming full circle, Fritz, my first dog, was in many ways also my first teacher. Fritz taught me that love, which is the highest form of connection and the highest expression of justice, should not be limited by arbitrary boundaries such as species. To love someone is to respect their being. It's to respect that no matter how different from us they are, they have a life that matters to them. Fritz taught me to be a witness. He taught me that love is a verb. And so this is why the goal of my presentation here tonight, and really the goal of my life's work, has been to raise awareness of the violent system that is carnism. Because for better or worse, we are all participants in the system. So our choice really is not whether we participate, but how we participate. And with awareness, we can choose to be active witnesses rather than passive bystanders. With awareness, we can lead more authentic and freely chosen lives. And then we can truly become, as Gandhi said, the change we wish to see. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Melanie Joy, for your very powerful presentation. I'll have to tell you, it's very rare that we have a speaker who gets a standing ovation like you got just now. Now, I invite all of you to go and enjoy some vegan refreshments, uh, courtesy of Down to Earth. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Have a safe return home. Good night. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website, at www.vsh.org, vsh.org.